welcome to today's episode of the Narratives of Grace, the Pastor's Corner. Today, Pastor Dennis and I are going to be uh, talking about the book of 1 Peter since he just finished a series uh, on it that he's been going through since February. Uh, and it's good to be able to talk about it and dig into a little bit. So let us uh, take a listen to this conversation. Yeah, I'm excited. This is, uh, I was just saying before we started recording, I think that this is one of my favorite books that I think we've ever, or I've ever preached through. And so uh, I think it's really appropriate for obviously the people it was directly written to, but uh, as things continue to progress or I guess you could say devolve in our society and, and throughout the world, it's, it's obviously a very ap- uh, appropriate book for us even today. It is interesting as a, a side note, because this year is the first year that I preached through a book. Um, it's the first year that I've preached regularly. Um, but I, I preached through the book of Colossians, now Jude, and now I'm in First Timothy. It's kind of amazing as you preach through a book and as you study and as you're living in it for an extended time, you see, you come to love that book for a time and see its applicability. But I think where you just finished and where I am now with First Peter and First Timothy uh, of the books that I mentioned today are the most directly applicable practically today. Uh, obviously, there's a lot in Colossians. Jude maybe still with that, but Timothy is basically an instruction manual for the church. And First Timoth- or First Peter, excuse me, is basically about persecution. Mm-hmm. Well, so First Peter, you're looking at Paul. Excuse me, First <laughs> Timothy, you're looking at Paul explaining to Timothy, hey, this is this is how it's going to look. You're going to you're going to lead and this is how it's going to happen. This is what you need to know. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to lead. This is how you need to serve. And all of those are very appropriate, very applicable. One thing that we keep hearing people say is as the COVID pandemic continues is we're seeing people and we're hearing people say things like, you know, as frustrating as this is, this gives us as our, you know, our church, this gives us an opportunity to reevaluate some of our practices. And I've heard that from so many different pastors. We've even said that, Mm -hmm. you know, this is, you know, there's no good time for a pandemic, but Mm -hmm. for our church, Mililani Baptist, you know, knowing the context of, January 2020 up through August 2020, if there ever was a good time for some worldwide event that would force us to reevaluate how we do things and why we do things and get us to focus back on our specific mission statement as a church, our vision statement as a church, it's now. You know, this is this is a very appropriate time for us to look at why do we spend as much as we spend on this? Why yeah. do we do as much as we do in that? Why are we pushing our efforts here instead of there? And now that we're able to ask all of those questions while at the same time going through as you said basically an instruction manual, it's very appropriate for us to go through 1 Timothy, but at the same time there are a lot of people who are suffering. There are a lot of people who are struggling. And while I would not consider what we're going through in this stage, now I'm talking about here on the island of Oahu in Hawaii, we are not being persecuted. As a church, we are not being targeted. We are not being suppressed. Um, I don't believe that we are. And so what we're looking at with first Peter is not necessarily just the persecution aspect, but just suffering in general. There are many people who have lost their jobs. Most people have lost hours. Um, nearly everyone has lost something in this. Uh, there are many people who know loved ones who have passed away or, or have loved ones who know of people who have passed away. This is not, this is not a hoax. It's not a, a fake pandemic. It's real. Okay. Now the science is still out. <laughs> the The scientific jury, so to speak, is still out on the severity and survivability rate and the rate of infection. All of those things are important for us to look at and evaluate as we make decisions about how we're going to do things. But no one can deny in the midst of this pandemic, there is a level of suffering that all of us have experienced to varying degrees, but suffering is there. Yeah. We began a series in First Peter because we were looking at having 
come out of a tumultuous time for our church and what do we need to know about moving forward and persevering? What we didn't realize was less than a month after we began this series, a greater sense of suffering would come. And so I think that God set us on this course and uh, and I'm thankful that we were able to to run it through and, and uh, wrap up the book uh, this past Sunday. Yeah. So let's look at a few different aspects of the book uh, and help us to just have a good conversation about it. But we'll talk about the author, the date, the purpose, uh, and then general themes throughout the book. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because these are all things that we need to talk about with any given book in the New Testament. And as much as we can in the Old Testament, it gets a little more complicated in the Old. But in the New Testament, I, I think there's very few books that we actually agree on who wrote it. Um, there's uh, aside from the gospels and even with the gospels, there's debate, but there's like three, I think that we actually agree on who wrote it. And as much as I thought Peter was an easy one to agree on, cause it says, uh, Peter and I'm Peter who is writing this. Nope. We still can't, we can't be happy with that. Well, we've seen that with Paul, you know, we see that with James, you know, well, which James, yeah. you know? And so, yeah, I, I think uh, scholars will find reasons to argue. Uh, I think that's, you know, part of it, but yeah, there is some disagreement about whether or not Peter wrote this. And there are some pretty interesting arguments as to why it wouldn't have been Peter. You know, it's, well, the Greek is too good. He was just a fisherman. Well, that's classist. (laughs) And he also studied with the best teacher ever for three years. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I don't know. Did Jesus pull him aside and do Greek lessons? You know, I I can, I can hear that argument, you know, but he was a middle-class fisherman who likely would have been taught Greek from his youth. So Mm -hmm. it's not necessarily unheard of for a Galilean fisherman to have strong Greek. Well, and we all know of middle class people that aren't looked at as intelligent that are extremely intelligent even whether it's in their field i know my dad is somebody that he can turn on the car and be like oh yeah that's what's wrong Mm -hmm. um but even outside of that i mean there's some uh naomi's dad is is very intelligent when it comes to historical stuff but nobody listens to him because he doesn't have any letters or anything right well you know so you look at the author it is peter you know um (laughs) the same peter that spent time with Jesus as one of his disciples and later apostles. Uh, you know, he, it is Peter. The, one of the arguments against Peter is his theology is too much like Paul's. Well, is that such a bad thing? You know, but I, I understand. I found that funny. I understand where they're coming from with, with a statement like that. Um, but there's nothing in the letter that I've found that disagrees with biblical theology. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's nothing in there that you read and you're like, I can't believe Peter says this when the rest of scripture says the opposite. And there are people who will make the argument with especially things talking about chosen exiles and, Hmm. you know, predestined for this. But, um, but again, there's nothing in this book that disagrees with, um, the general thrust of, of scripture. So, so there are several arguments against Peter. None of them are good. Uh, none of them are compelling arguments. And, uh, and, and I say none of them are good. Obviously that's probably somewhat subjective. Um, but the truth is we, we don't have a very compelling argument to deny, um, the, uh, patristic authorship. Um, so, here we are. We have Peter. He writes this letter. Um, now, the question is when? Mm-hmm. Well, that's a difficult thing um, because it's not like he put his date in the top right-hand corner as he submitted his paper. You know, that's not how this works. And so we have to figure out what are the things he's discussing, what what's happening in the book, what's happening at the time that this was likely written. And if you agree with uh, Peter as the author, then that helps you to determine the date is probably early to mid 60s. If you disagree with Peter's authorship, that could give you a little bit later of a date, um, you know, somewhere in even the 90s or the the early hundreds. Um, I I don't agree with that. I think it is the early to mid 60s. 
I and think the '90s as late as you can get and still call it canon because they they need to be written by people that were witnesses to Christ, right? And you know, you can say, well, Paul wasn't a disciple, no, but he he witnessed the aspects of it. He was right. one of the Pharisees. Well, and you know, where did he go when he spent the was it the three years in Arabia? Yeah, you know, I I believe Jesus was there. Mm-hmm. Um, but with Peter, the um, the date is probably. I, and there's some disagreement on this, and that's fine. For me personally, I would say probably early to mid-60s before Nero really ramped up the persecution. So I would say this is probably before the Roman fire, mm-hmm. um, before Nero burnt down half of Rome and, and decided to use the Christians as scapegoats. Um, now, is it possible that this was written shortly after the fire absolutely mm. does it change the application not at all no um honestly what it does is if this is later that only enhances what peter was saying it strengthens you know it makes it e- even even more of a, a stark contrast between what you would expect and what peter is saying you have peter saying obey your masters you know um pray for caesar you know you you have uh, the emperor, you have these really big statements that if you're in the middle of watching your brothers and sisters being murdered and being sewn into the skins of wild animals and hunted down and tracked or being lit on fire to be human torches for Nero's psychotic garden walks, um, you look at these things and it's like, and yet Peter is saying, give honor to Caesar, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's a tough call. That's a tall order that Peter's good. So if you give the date a little bit later into Nero's persecution, it only strengthens what Peter is saying. Um, but I, I don't believe that it was after the fire. I think that Peter wrote this prior and, uh, and I think he wrote this at a time when persecution was beginning, but it was more, uh, more neighbor on neighbor, persecution, um, person on person rather than state sponsored persecution. Um, but I think he, he wrote this, God inspired him to write. He sent this to believers and encouraged them to suffer well, because while they were suffering currently, the suffering was about to get far worse. Yeah. And, um, you know, we have to remember when we talk about authorship, yes, Peter wrote this, but who inspired the omniscient, all-knowing God? And so when God breathed out these words and inspired Peter to write, um, you know, it's not uncommon for us to recognize, you know, God is is instructing him to write, and he's writing these things. Is it possible that it came before the persecution, but it was for the persecution? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and that, that's one of the aspects. So a lot of times... When I'm talking about things like this, some people may ask, why do we care when it was written? But it really does have a big influence on different aspects and different readings. And and I think it, I agree, it makes sense to be early 60s um, to me. And this is me using non-inspired logic, but if something like what was happening in Rome in the later, mid-later 60s with Nero was happening during this time, there'd be some kind of reference to uh, something like, uh, you know, even when the, the government persecutes you honor Caesar, something like that. Yeah. Well, and it, I mean, it does later on and it, it does mention, you know, even if these guys aren't, aren't doing things, uh, even if they're not doing things for your benefit, you need to, yeah. you need to submit to authority. Um, you know, and, and that's true. Obviously, it's, it's scripture, so we want to abide by that. But yeah, I think if it had been after the fire, maybe there would have been some reference to the way that persecution had ramped up so rapidly and uh, and how it had become so severe. Um, I think that you would have expected some type of reference, but it's entirely possible oh, yeah. that he didn't. And as a matter of fact, he never actually mentions Rome by name. He talks about Babylon. And now some, some scholars believe when he says Babylon, that's code for Rome because he was in Rome and, and it's like, you know, some people say, well, he didn't want to use Rome because he didn't want to accuse them of anything. Like, he literally tells them to obey. Yeah. <laughs> it would be like if he wanted to quote and say like, Hey, Nero's a jerk, but listen, you gotta follow. 
Well, you know, I mean, yeah. he could have done that, but a lot of uh, a lot of the New Testament authors talk about Babylon in that way, um, whether it was because of inspiration or just that's what they did. But it, it adds to the interpretation and, and revelation with Babylon being the power, mm-hmm. wherever the power is, which yeah. at that time would have been Rome. Yeah, and that's I think that's honestly where people draw the idea that in Peter he must be talking about Rome in Revelation they were talking about Rome so it, it seems like a fairly consistent thing to do uh, and so so that gives us a, a, a potential date early to mid 60s potentially late 60s I would reject anything much later than that yeah um, so then now the question is we kind of dealt with this a little bit but why why did Peter write this? And these are these three questions are ones that we ask with every one of the books, but I think this is by far the most important. Um, the author kind of gives us an idea of their background and where they're coming from. The date gives us a little bit of context, but purpose is the most important to interpreting well. And this one is obviously um, worship God, worship Christ, worship God, the Trinity, even in persecution. Um, and still be good citizens, even in persecution, because that adds to your testimony. Um, and obviously it goes deeper, it goes a little bit more, but that the government, and I think this is something we need to hear right now. The government is not your hope. The government, even in the best times is not your savior. It's Christ. (laughs) Christ is the living hope. Right. Well, and that's, that's where we need to consistently be, return to is the the idea of reminding people listen i love living in america Mm -hmm. i am so thankful that i was born and raised in america and have the opportunity and the blessings and the privileges that are afforded to american citizens don't get me wrong i am very very thankful for all of those things the older i get the more i am realizing america is not where my hope lies. Mm-hmm. So when Peter says, always be able to give an answer for the hope that lies within you, newsflash, the answer is not, well, cause I'm an American, you know, um, we can't continue on in our Christian life with this American mindset and expect things to continue. We have to have a biblical worldview, not just an American set of ideals or values, especially right now because we see our society is degrading to the point that val- values and morals don't mean what they used to mean. Mm-mm. Truth doesn't even the word truth, you know, doesn't mean what it used to mean because if we don't like the meaning, we just change the meaning. And so we, we say all of that. Well, here we have this book, this letter where Peter is saying, life is going to get hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be um, uncomfortable at best, uh, excruciating, uh, and um, maybe even deadly at mm-hmm. worst. Uh, but remember that the blessings you have in your salvation currently are enough and the grace is there enough to carry you forward and allow you to continue serving him faithfully. But the hope in that future ultimate salvation, the hope that we have in the ultimate and final salvation, that's what we're striving toward. That's, That's, you know, you run a race, you want to keep your eyes on the finish line and stay focused, laser focus on that finish line, because that's where you're driving towards. That's where you're going. You don't want to look off to the left or the right and get distracted. Just stay focused and keep moving. And if you do that, you know, you have a better chance of, of continuing in a race. Well, here we know what the hope is. We know where we're headed. We know that eventually there is coming a day where all of this will burn away and we will be with him for for all of eternity with a new heaven, a new earth, and the blessings and privileges that are in our heavenly kingdom are far greater than anything this American system could you know we see this several times in scripture, but that this just this place isn't our home that we've been made uh, a nation as believers that that the body of Christ universal is a nation in and of itself um and and that's an important thing to realize as hard as it can be at different times that we have more in common with certain people in in China Egypt 
wherever else you want to say that the culture is so different than we do in our with some of our neighbors because we have that hope we've been made a a, a holy nation because of that mm-hmm. well and as with most of the epistles you have your purpose pretty clearly given at the beginning you know peter says the beginning of of his letter he says peter an apostle of jesus christ again there's naming himself um, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in pontius galatia um, cappadocia asia bithynia according to the foreknowledge of god the father in the sanctification of the spirit for obedience to jesus christ and for sprinkling with his blood may grace and peace be multiplied to you he tells them from the very beginning i am writing so that grace and peace are multiplied to you who are who's the you Mm -hmm. who is he writing to he's writing to the elect exiles of the dispersion those who have been scattered those who are chosen for this moment they are chosen by god to go through this period of suffering for a reason Mm -hmm. and it is imperative that they understand their need and their calling and their responsibility to suffer well, following the example of Christ, following the example of those who have gone before them, knowing that the suffering that they face is not uncommon to the rest of the brotherhood around the world, that what they are going through, what they are suffering through is meant to give them the opportunity to obey Christ in so much as they see him being glorified through their obedience and then also all of those who see their obedience and then begin to glorify their father as well. And so there's there's a this is a short purpose statement, mm-hmm. but man, there's a lot of theology <laughs> in this. No, yeah, and that that's a it, it seems that Peter's writing is like that, that you really could take a full year in this book pretty easily if you wanted to. Almost um, did. <laughs> yeah. And, and and that's just it. I mean, you really could do it just a few verses at a time and just get so much because every statement is so dense um, and different aspects of it, even with the... the um, royal nation holy priesthood and i am pretty sure i said those backwards but it's that that phrase that those that one verse but you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellence of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light you could do a sermon easily on that one verse because there's so much yeah you know there's contemporary worship songs based on that Mm-hmm. passage uh but you know like you said there every verse is w- is weighed down with theology not in a negative sense no. but i mean it's it's heavy it's thick there's a lot to digest here you know you you come in there's certain books that you come into and you know it's a lighter meal mm-hmm. um you know there's some passages it's more like appetizers or hors d'oeuvres but then you have continuing with the metaphor of food you have others it's like you're, you're gonna need a minute yeah <laughs> you know, you, you're gonna need to digest this slowly chew all the way <laughs> you know, I, it's like a little kid when they're learning to eat solid food and like chew your food you don't want to choke on this this is this is big stuff you know and and we can get there in peter's writing yeah well and i think there's some books that that are avoided in the new Testament to preach from because of their weightiness. One being like Hebrews and the other big one that I always think of is, is first and second Peter. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we often avoid revelation, but that's for other reasons. Um, because it's confusing. <laughs> uh, but so here's the interesting thing. So right now in, at Milani Baptist Church, if you come on a Sunday morning up until this past weekend, you've been hearing first Peter. On Sunday night, we've began a, a you've begun a series in First Peter. So we've got Peter's theology. First Timothy. What did I say? You said First Peter again. I'm glad you're here. Uh, <laughs> yes, First Timothy. Um, so we've got Peter writing. I think I just got ahead of myself. Uh, <laughs> so we've got Peter's theology and and going through what Peter's telling us. We've got Paul writing to Timothy, and we all know. Paul's writings are pretty deep. Yeah. Um, you know, later Peter, I think it's second Peter, he talks about like, I see you've been reading, I hear you've been reading the letters of Paul and a very paraphrased version of that is 
good luck with that. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's deep. And then, you know, John has been going through Hebrews mm -hmm. and, uh, there's a commentary that was written by, I believe it's Al Mohler, uh, the, the beginning of the commentary, he, <laughs> he starts off by saying the book of Hebrews is not for the, the theologically faint of heart. Nope. Uh, so right now at Milani Baptist, you've got a dense theologically book in Hebrews. Uh, you've got um, a, an incredible letter to Timothy from Paul that is dense theologically and practical aspects. But then we've also been going through First Peter. Uh, I feel like if anybody comes and like, I just don't feel like I'm being fed. You know, there's a lot of food being offered. The table is full. Come eat. But digest it slowly. Take your time. Read through. Look at verse 3 of chapter 1. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's some, there's some theology proper. There's some um, Christology there talking about the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and understand who Jesus is. According to his great mercy, there's some theology. He has caused us, so there's causality, there's some theology, uh, to be born again. Well, what does that mean? Let's talk about what Jesus, what Jesus told uh, Nicodemus and what Jesus told the rich young ruler. And, and you look at these things, and we're, we haven't even finished verse 3 yet. And yeah. there's so many aspects of theology, and we could continue. Um, but as you go through, the, each verse is like this. Uh, and we haven't even gotten to any of the imperatives yet, you know, and so this is a deep book and, mm -hmm. and I love this book. I love that we were able to go through this. I'm thankful. But again, why did he write it to give a theological foundation for suffering? Well, yeah. And, and it, it, it's that reminder in that, that being born again, that Christ is our living hope that he didn't die and that filled it, but that he died and rose again. Uh, which which paid for our sin, but it's also the theme of holiness through in different places throughout that that we're called to be holy, and the only reason why we can be holy is because we're called to be so. That mm -hmm. God, the only way to become holy is God making it so, mm -hmm. um, and and I think that's that's important and and showing our christ likeness to the world is part of that being called to be holy and the way that we react to persecution whether it's big or small intentional or unintentional and i think in that we need to be very careful today in the u.s talking about persecution of the church um the lockdowns in most states are not persecution uh we cannot like different parts of the hawaii one but it's not persecuting the church i would argue from things that i've seen that hawaii's governor and Oahu's mayor are two of the best actually in dealing with the church, at least since the reopening. Um, I've been pleasantly things. surprised. Yeah. Now when you go to Las Vegas or Nevada in general and California, that's different. And, and I'll say Las Vegas and, and LA in particular, because they're, they're doing something different. They're, they, they said, you know, casinos can open normally, but churches can only have X amount of people. We don't care how big your building is. I think it was 50. Um, you can only have 50 people in your church, even if you have a sanctuary that can fit 3,000. You can still only have 50. Mm -hmm. That's a different thing than saying you can open, but you need to be socially distanced. Right. Um, with, with LA not being able to open at all, that's different than saying you can open, but you have to wear masks. Right. Masks are not persecution. Yeah. And, you know, I don't want to get off on a, you know, following a rabbit hole, but... <laughs> But, you know, we are not in that same context. However, this book is important because we could very easily jump there. Mm -hmm. uh, we could very easily, you know, we talked about this. There was an announcement made that we felt like, well, this goes against what we, what we hold dear. So we're going to have an issue with this. And then when the published order actually came out, it had been adjusted and we're like, well, based on this, we're, we, we don't really have an argument. And now the latest order that was published last night went into effect this morning. Um, the singing rules are not part of the church rules. Yeah. Now, the church must follow that, uh, but it's in a separate area, which means it's not just churches aren't allowed to do this or not just individual you know, Christians have to follow this. This is everyone. If you're in an indoor and outdoor setting, this, these are the regulations you must follow if you're going to be singing, if you're going to be playing wind instruments. 
you know, if you're going to be shouting at each other, whatever, like the, this, this is how you do it, you know? And so we look at these things and we say, yes, we cannot rightly here in Hawaii. We cannot rightly at this moment in time, as it is being recorded near the end of August, 2020, hmm. we cannot say I am being persecuted against by my government. We're not. Uh, but there is a level of suffering. So whether it's state-sponsored suffering, whether it's neighbors who judge you for either wearing a mask or not wearing a mask, whether it's you know individual suffering because people don't like that you are a believer, we can talk about those kinds of suffering or th that kind of struggle. Uh, but to just slap the persecution um, stamp on things, we need to be careful about that. And especially because we have brothers and sisters around the world who actually are being persecuted, who actually are being threatened with their lives, who are being killed for the cause of Christ. And we don't want to diminish what they're experiencing yeah. because we needlessly equate, you know, a mo a, a, I don't know, uh, a mild inconvenience. And now we've elevated it in our minds to the same level as being tortured for Christ. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. And we need to be careful about that. But we've been talking about, uh, I think we've transitioned over to talking about some of the themes. Suffering well is a major theme in this book. The living yeah. hope that we have in Christ is a major theme in this book. Being a holy nation a people that have been set apart. That is uh, a very interesting theme because we see in this book that Peter really, um, really goes back to the idea of the Israelites and explains how now the Gentiles fit within this. And, uh, and so he's moved and looked at, this is what the Old Testament has taught us about the holy nation that was Israel. Look at what the church ha is doing, what the church has been called into. And you can see there, there's some, some similarities and there are some differences. Uh, but you see the Old Testament value system, the Old Testament worship system, and now how does that look for modern-day Christians who are suffering? Well, the call to glorify God hasn't changed. The call to be holy hasn't changed. Uh, Peter quotes Isaiah an awful lot in this yep. book. Uh, he quotes from the Psalms, he quotes from Proverbs, he quotes from many other areas. And you look at all these things, and there's so much in this book that's teaching us this is not a new concept. You know, you may be a new creation, you have a new identity, you have a new home, okay? But you don't have a new command. You don't have yeah. a new calling. This has been there, and it's time to stand up and to do what he's called you to do. Yeah, and, and I think along with that, the biggest thing that we, we need to take from First Peter in that way is how to act in that situation. Um, whether or not we think it's justified, whether or not we think it should be done, there's a time when we need to say, okay, uh, like right now with the singing, they changed the order so legally my issue was was an actual legal thing now the way they've changed it okay that's not there but the way i'm seeing it is whether or not i agree with the singing mandate which is a whole podcast in and of itself <laughs> um for right now we are going to be good neighbors and we're going to abide by it the only ones singing sunday morning are naomi and i because that's how we've been able to set it up so that we can abide by it. Um, we, we re I readjusted the stage, you know, I, I moved to the other, I switched places with one of our other band members so that there is enough space to do it right. And all of that fun stuff, but that that's showing something that's giving a testimony that we may not agree with it, but we're going to listen to it right now for the health and safety of all of our, our people, at least for a time. Right. And that time will come to an end, but that that's fine. We, we, we need to listen to what this is saying. And, and even in suffering, even if this was bad enough to say is true suffering, part of it is to do it well, do it in a way that still glorifies God and still respecting authority. Right. Well, and I want to go back and just make sure that I clarify. When, when I say we can't equate what we're suffering with, with what other people are, are dealing with, just because other people are being killed for their faith does not mean that what you're struggling with is not real. What I mean is we need to keep things in their proper 
context, the, the yeah. right perspective. Um, <clears throat> what you're struggling with is real. And if you are listening to this and you're struggling and you're having a difficult time, especially with the continuing stay at home orders that have now developed into, I think, basically everything but grocery stores, a few other types of businesses and churches, everything else is shut down. Yeah. And so um, you cannot, now you can't even go, uh, you can't even go fishing with your buddy. Um, you can't gather in groups of more than, you know, more than two, two, it actually says two or more. Um, well, then they're not groups if it's yeah. no groups of two or more. Uh, but if you're in the water, not standing on the shore. If you're in the water, then technically you can still go fishing. So I say that to bring up a little nitpicky thing for me, but, but to point out your ability and opportunities to get together with other people have been limited. Yeah. Um, thankfully gathering together of believers that is still allowed. Yeah. We are able to do this. Um, so we would encourage you to come to church, to get your sense of community from here, to gather with like-minded believers and to grow with them. But if you're struggling because you're isolated or you're struggling because you haven't been able to be around people, I'm not saying that, well, that doesn't matter because you're, it's not, at least you're not being killed. So, yeah. you know, just tough it out. No, if you're suffering, that's real and that's legitimate. But there's something in this book for you. Yeah. Uh, if you're struggling with, you know, you lost your job, there's something in this book for you. If you're struggling because uh, a family member was sick and you're not able to visit with them, you're not able to be with them, there's something in there for you um, because we are told how to suffer well. Um, but talking about the authorities, Peter specifically says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or governors who are sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. He says, live as people who are free, and it continues on. But the, the purpose of bringing that specific section up is, notice he says, be subject for the Lord's sake. It's not about making yourself popular. It's not about making a name for yourself and getting your name on the on the TV or in the news you know it's it's for the Lord's sake why yeah. are why are we submitting to authorities because by doing so we have an opportunity to bring glory to God mm -hmm. what whatever theme we want to pick whatever aspect of this book we want to look at it all brings us to the same place glorify your father in heaven mm -hmm. even when it's hard even when it's difficult, this book teaches us how to continue glorifying the Father through being obedient in the midst of suffering, even suffering to the point of death. Because we know that even if, even if our life is taken from us here, we are ushered into the presence of a holy and eternal God knowing that our presence with him for all of eternity is that blessed hope that we're striving for. And so even if we are killed, even if they are persecuting us to the point that we are put to death or that we suffer to the point of death in some other way, death for us is gain. Mm -hmm. To be in the presence of God is the greatest blessing that we have yet to receive, but we know it's coming and we can continue suffering well. Amen. Um, and and I, I encourage everyone that, that if you weren't here for any of that to go back and watch the sermons, they're um, almost all online. Some will be going up this week. Uh, there is one that, that a chunk is missing out of just because of technical difficulties, but you know, that happens. Um, but I encourage everyone to go listen to those, read through First Peter. Um, if you are finding yourself in suffering, whether it's... Um, whatever kind it is, I encourage you to, to find one of the books on first Peter and read through it and look at what that is. Um, well, I'll, I'll say this really fast. Um, as we're talking about suffering. We're talking about those that are having a difficult time. I think it's appropriate as we relay this back to scripture, but also, you know, one of our church members, uh, his name is Mark DiBernardo. Uh, he, did something pretty special today. Uh, he was on a rowing machine and wearing a, a special uh, 
a gas mask uh, to raise awareness for suicide prevention. Um, and, uh, and he rode uh, a distance of, I believe it was 48,400 meters. And that's a ridiculous distance. Uh, and I'm super proud of him for doing that. But, but the purpose of doing that was to bring awareness to those in the military community that are struggling. And, and I say that because knowing that this podcast is going out to our membership, knowing that it's going out beyond our membership, but our context here at Mililani is a very military heavy church. Uh, we know that many of our members come from either active military, former military, uh, or military dependents. And so we, we know that there are a large number of military folks in our community. When we talk about suffering, I think we'd be remiss at this point to mention the very real um, epidemic that's going on within the military community of, of 22 um, service members per day mm-hmm. uh, choosing to end their life in suicide. And so if you are struggling, I want to be very, very clear. There is hope. There is help. We're going to add um, the suicide prevention uh, hotline into the show notes and make sure that you know you have the resources you need. Uh, but I would encourage you to read through the book of Philippians uh, about having joy uh, in the midst of adversity, have, reading this book here, First Peter, uh, remembering how as believers we can suffer well. Um, and, and I say all of that knowing as believers we have hope. Mm-hmm. Um, but we know that those who do not believe, they don't have the same hope. Um, there is no hope for those who are apart from Christ. And so for each and every one of us that are listening to this, as we talk about First Peter and we talk about what it means to suffer well and to glorify God and to use every moment of suffering as an opportunity for obedience, we talk about all of these things. Reach out and talk to someone. Reach out and encourage someone. If you know that they're struggling, um, if you know that they're hurting, encourage them, um, yeah. share scripture with them, be willing to pray with them. You, you don't have to have all the answers. Uh, most times when people are suffering, they don't want someone to to uh, give them all the answers. What they want is just someone to hear them, uh, just someone to talk to. And so if you're struggling and you're having a, a difficult time or you're even to the point of suicidal thoughts and, and um, working through those things, Please reach out to us. Please yeah. talk to us. We would we would love the opportunity to get to know you and to, and to work through that and, and to help you in any way that we can. But just at the very least, just to let you know, there is someone there. There's someone here that is willing to hear you out, that is willing to talk to you. Uh, and so, again, I, I'm thankful for Mark uh, and, and his efforts to bring awareness to to that area of suffering. Um, but this book here, First Peter, gives us uh, a window into uh, how to suffer well and in any type of suffering, and and I think it's it's very appropriate that we address that. Yeah, and the book that I was looking for that I, I had to look it up is the the Christ Centered Exposition series. It, it's they're basically um, simplified commentary. It's not formal commentary. It, it's more devotional commentary, but it goes a little bit deeper. They're so, still building that yeah. that library, and I don't think First Peter has been. Do released they not have yet. the First Peter one yet? Not I think yet. I think it's like has a date or something. It's supposed to. So when I started the series, it didn't it didn't even have a date. I think oh, they have a date now. Yeah. So I was like, oh come on, but but they're coming out. They do have a really really good one on James. They have a really yeah. fantastic one on Hebrews. Uh, really, most of the Bible, except for the one I was preaching through. <laughs> I th- yeah, but, I was going to say that because they have a lot of the Old Testament ones. They do. Too. Yeah. Um, I but, think there's a really good one on, on Isaiah. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like Pastor Dennis said, struggling doesn't just come from the outside. It comes from the inside. So if you're struggling in some way with that, with, with anxiety or especially with any uh, suicidal thoughts, tendencies, please reach out to somebody, whether it's us or someone else. Um, but we will put that in the show notes. But um, that's an important thing that, that you're not here to suffer alone, that, that, that you have Christ, but that Christ has put a body of believers around you to help you. And even if you aren't a believer, but you're struggling, please reach out. We'd love to talk to you and, and um, help you in whatever way we can. But um, let us end this time of discussing First Peter and, and, and all of the themes in it with a, a word of prayer. Sure. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for uh, really every opportunity you give Pastor Caleb and I a chance to have these conversations. And and Lord, we do pray that these are glorifying to you, but also helpful for those that are listening. And and Father, we want to continue these. And and so if there uh, are things that you would have us to speak on, I, I just pray that you would impress those upon our hearts. And, and Lord, uh, just allow us to be found faithful, uh, that we would continue to do what you've called us to do. But 
But Lord, I, I thank you uh, specifically right now. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this letter that we have that was inspired by you, written by Peter, delivered by Sylvanus, and uh, offered to the saints in such a way that we have it today and we can glean from the wisdom and the, the, um, the, the uh, just all of the insight that is in here as to how to deal with suffering and how to deal with it well. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to continue learning. You would help us to continue growing. Father, I, I pray that you would just lead us to be like your son. If there are any that are struggling, that are hearing this prayer, that are re- listening to this podcast, that are studying through First Peter, Father, I pray that you would encourage their hearts. I pray that you would give peace that surpasses all understanding, that you would, Lord, through your spirit, as you promised to be a friend and a guide uh, for those who believe that you would... Uh, give them comfort uh, through your spirit, Father. If there's any that are struggling, that they would be willing to open up and to reach out and to seek the help that, that they need and the help that they're looking for. But Father, we know that there is a hope that is reserved for those who believe. There is a hope that we are longing for. There's something that we are striving toward. Your word tells us very clearly to always be ready to give an answer that is a defense for the hope that is within us. So help us to study this out, to be ready, to continue to glorify you in the way that we obey in the, in the midst of suffering but also in the way that we share your goodness and your grace and your love with others. So I pray that you would just do all these things for your glory, for your honor, through Jesus, your son. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of The the Pastor's Corner. Uh, we hope that it was a blessing and, and shed some additional light on the book of First Peter and some of the details around it. Uh, for the sermons uh, on that, from Pastor Dennis. You can go to our YouTube page or our Facebook page. They're um, all on there. You can, uh, they both have special lists that you can see uh, for that to have them all in one place. Uh, but if you have any questions or comments either about this or any of our other podcasts or want to request a topic for us to discuss, please just email us at pastor at mbaptist.org. We'd love to get those and answer any questions or address any uh, questions or issues that, that anyone may have. If you have any prayer requests, whether or not you're a member of our church, we'd love to be praying with and for each and every one of you. You can just email us at prayer at mbaptist.org. For more information on Mililani Baptist Church, please visit our website at mbaptist.org or follow us on social media and YouTube. Thank you for joining us today, and we pray that you will join us again next time. Thank you.